And thirdly, just knowing that whatever I create would benefit generations to come. Mm -hmm. So as I'm creating things and I'm looking, you know, into the future, like, can I create something that would be able to be handed down and will impact people when I'm gone? Welcome to a True Goddess podcast, where we inspire you to embrace your authentic self, be healed, supported, accepted, and empowered to live the life you desired. On today's episode of A True Goddess, you will meet with beautiful Sandra D. Robinson. She had decades of successful career as an actress and a movie star and had major roles on Another World, Bold and the Beautiful, General Hospital, Days of Our Lives, and guest stars on primetime shows and films like CSI Miami and many, many others. You will hear her inspiring stories of how she battled the feeling of being an unwanted child and overcame her stage fright, a latchkey kid who turned her solitary childhood and her wild imagination into a successful career in modeling and acting. She shared the story of her heart guided shift in her career to help others to step into their magnificent design, the media has labeled Sandra D. Robinson as the Charisma Coach. With a certification in Horse Assistant Therapy, Hypnosis, Stage Mastery and NLP, and other education in positive psychology and animal behavior, Sandra's mission is to move hard-driven leaders from where they are to where they are designed to be. She supports them to share the message of their brand or cause through speaking, video, television, or any high-risk presentations. Without further ado, let's meet our magnificent guest, Sandra D. Robinson. Welcome to A True Goddess Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Sass. Today, we have with us an inspiring guest and great friend of mine that I got to know, Sandra D. Robinson. It's a pleasure to have you here with us today, Sandra. Welcome, Sandra. Thank wow. you for being here. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> that intro. <laughs> I was like, that, that takes like, <laughs> like the whole podcast. <laughs> I'm good now. Yeah. That was a long, a long version. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so glad to be here. Thank you so much. Your energy is amazing. What you bring to the world is amazing. So I'm glad I can be a part of it. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Tell us a little bit more about yourself, Sandra, and, and where you grew up. I grew up in an area just outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So I would just say Pittsburgh. Not people would know where that is, but Western Pennsylvania. Uh, my parents were, you know, my, my father ran an auto body. My mother worked at a bank for most of the time that I grew up. So Nowhere in there was there any inkling of any, you know, uh, TV or acting chops. I don't know where that actually came from, to be honest. I mean, I kind of have some guesses, but it was not something that I was surrounded by at all. But I'm very grateful that I grew up there. It's beautiful. It's really beautiful. Um, my siblings were way older than me. And so um, I know Dr. Says, you know this about me, that my mother did not expect, nor did she really care to have children in general, I was certainly not one that she was very happy about. So I grew up with some negative stuff going on in my in my home, which, you know, I'm sure I'm not the only one. There's probably plenty of people that are listening to you and watching this right now that can identify with that. It's unfortunately not uncommon. I have a lot of people tell me that they have similar experiences or quite honestly, much worse. I mean, but um, my father was wonderful and loving in his own kind of way. And um, I'm glad that I had a mother like I did because she really did make me what I am today. You know, through the course of my journey, it I was pushed into the direction that I'm going partly because she wasn't easy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know that movie, um, uh, what is it? Bruce Almighty, right? When they said, when you ask God for patience, does God give you patience or the opportunity to be patient? Yes, exactly. <laughs> Never ask for patience. <laughs> Never ask for that. You will have the opportunity to, to learn it. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. I, I, I believe that life gives us, you know, present us with opportunities after opportunities for just things yeah. to learn, right? 
right? Yeah. Life lesson. I just had a had a a wonderful, amazing man come into our church on um, this past weekend, and um, he leads an incredible um, program with young people in New York, and uh, I mean, like by the thousands, he is he is causing them to come in off the streets and hand over their their guns. I mean, not not causing them; they are voluntarily coming in and changing their ways because of the way he is speaking to them. It's amazing, this guy. But he said something that was really interesting, similar to what you just said, which mm -hmm. is, are we looking at what we think is a mess? as this situation that we're having difficulty as this struggle are we looking at this and only looking for the exit because if that's what we're doing that's a natural thing to do mm -hmm. but if that's the only thing we're doing we could be missing opportunity to be helping others learning things like like you said along the way mapping out how we can then share the experience with other people and either prevent them from having it or talk them through it so opportunity is in the the struggle for sure yeah. Yeah, for sure. And, and, you know, not everybody's lives are easy growing up, right? And that's what make who you are. And, yeah. you know, you're uh, this magnificent person that we're going to get to know more about in a little bit. And, and, you know, you're growing up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and, and not surrounded by any movie scene <laughs> and all this stuff. What, what lead you to become an actress? I mean, doors must be open for you like crazy. I mean, Where did that come from? <laughs> um, <laughs> I know it does seem really odd, but I think, you know, as a very young girl, I was what they call a latchkey kid. So I would come home and there'd be nobody there, no parents there. When I get home from school, there would just be the TV, which would keep me company. And I would watch reruns of old shows basically is what I was allowed to watch. We didn't have cable. So it was like whatever was on, you know, and I would watch these old shows and I got very involved in them. And then soap operas, when I got a little older, soap operas would come on. It was General Hospital that I would run home to watch. But there was a way that TV would usually keep me entertained and, and taught me, believe it or not, a lot of things because of those hours that I was so influential in those younger years and it had a lot of impact on me, which is an important lesson for now as leaders of families can realize what the impact is of looking at the screens. You know, what are kids taking in? I didn't have social media when I was growing up. So for me, the influence was strictly these old TV shows. And there was something kind of romantic about it that I wished that could be an escape for me. When I went into school and we had to do a play, you know, the school plays, and I think it was fifth grade, I got to play a character and I I just dove right into it. And I think part of it, the fascination for me was my imagination was very strong because my mother didn't want to spend time with me. Mm -hmm. I was allowed to be in the room with her if I was quiet. So I remember I learned how to play jacks and solitaire so that I could sit in the corner and not make noise. And that was okay. And so it felt very uncomfortable, but it was my mom and I wanted to be there. So mm -hmm. that was like as close to being accepted as I felt that I could get with her. But there was something about actually getting validation for doing something well when I dove with this crazy imagine. The imagination grew because I was by myself. Does that make sense? I don't think I made yeah. that. Connection. So if I was by myself, I could either, you know, sit and play jacks with her or most of the time I would still be, you know, looking to to be a kid. So I'd be bored after playing solitaire in the corner for a while. <laughs> and I would go out and I would usually be in nature and I would invent my friends in nature and try to figure out how the birds talk to one another, one another. And I would create little stories for them. And, you know, my imagination went, went crazy because I was alone. And that was just kind of what my brain decided to do to keep me entertained. So when I learned about the opportunity to act, I dove right into it and I got I got accolades for it. I didn't get a lot of that conversation at home. It was usually critical. And so I think that it was very attractive to me. And so then the next opportunity I had in school to do a play, I jumped at it. And I, you know, I, I kind of followed that. I also happened to have a stroke of luck that I had a photographer see me when I was 11. Mm -hmm. My sister actually tried to be a model at that point. 
um, for whatever reason, they weren't interested in her, but they said, can we take pictures of your little sister? Obviously that caused some problems within the family. Oh, gosh. <laughs> yes. uh, you know, at 11, I started modeling and showing up in the local papers and things like that. And it was that agent that actually introduced me to a television, um, or I would say a, 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 a talent manager that came from New York. And he was looking for people to represent in television and film. And, and so he wanted to see who she had in her agency. and. She almost didn't call me. I was a last minute call and I was the last one for him to see. And I ended up driving this talent manager back to the airport because he was very concerned you couldn't get a, a, an Uber those days. <laughs> and so I said, well, I can drive you. And the one thing that I could do growing up was, you know, I knew cars, I knew how to drive, I knew how to get there fast and safe. And so believe it or not, that's what I did. And I, we talked on the way. And he, I remember he has this accent, picture Joe Pesci when I say this, he looked at me and goes, I don't know about that Titus. You got something. You got something, kid. I'm telling you, you got something. <laughs> and I'm like, all right. You know, and I kind of didn't think it was serious, but when the time came that he said, Can you get up to New York? I have an audition for you. I used a little bit of money that I had in my little savings account from my local modeling and things to go. Mm -hmm. And I had I went up that summer. I had five screen tests in four months, which is unheard of. That's in extremely rare. And I didn't know that it was rare. I was so ignorant. You know, ignorance <laughs> is <bliss>. bliss. <laughs> Truly. Like, I was upset. I remember sitting in his office going, I don't know why I haven't booked anything, you know, and I'm sure that there's super talented Broadway actors sitting around me that were like rolling their eyes, you know, like, oh my gosh, kid, you know. <laughs> but I didn't know that, that that wasn't how it was. And so I walked into, and it's a great lesson in manifestation in a way, you know, that ignorance is bliss. And it's also so blind that I didn't see failure. I walked into the audition like, okay, I'm here. I'm here for my role. And not in an egotistical way, just because I really didn't know any better. <laughs> you know? And so there was something about that ownership, I think, that I took of it. Yeah, that ended yeah. up being a great lesson for me later on. You know, I didn't always have, I went through ups and downs with my self-esteem and how I saw myself. And I certainly didn't always walk into auditions that way. But I think in the beginning, there was a lesson there for sure. It was just this focus on on the end result of what I what I expected, you know, in yeah. my, my <laughs> naive perspective. Um, but yeah, yeah. So that led to my first job, actually. And I I moved up there and stayed on that role for six years. I left at other shows, came back to that same show. So I was in New York for all nine years. Oh, wow. Working. Yeah. Well, nice. Nice. That that got to be um, like a huge difference, though, from, you know, Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, there's a story. There's a casting director for one of the soaps who I think he did eventually hire me at one point. He gave me my first audition in New York City for a show that has been off the air for a long time. It was called Loving. And um, he now works on General Hospital. But Mark says to me, he goes, do you remember? He goes, when you first came in for the, for, the, for the audition, you know, for the first audition, I'm like, yeah. He goes, New York City, mind you. Like, Dr. Saz, I'm looking at you're dressed for New York City. People were black, <laughs> just black. It's like, it's a, that's just how it is, right? Yeah. And I show up with my white granny boots, my white long skirt, my purple fuzzy shirt. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I, it was awful and my big you know funky earrings and it was I was an 80s dress nightmare I mean it was horrible and it's like 1989 I think when I when I went up there and so I was just total geek from you know the Midwest showing up without a clue about the big city and and it just screamed in the way I looked, you know, and and so he'll still tease me. Mark's like, do you remember that first audition? Yes, yes, uh, yes, <laughs> yes, I do. Thank you. <laughs> but you got the role. I did. They called my manager. It, eventually, the, the people that hired me called my manager and said, well, we, you know, we love her. We're going to hire her. We have to make sure she doesn't dress like that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's you know, it's it's you. It's not the outfit that you were wearing, right? <laughs> now, let's just say I think that what you're wearing is part of your personal brand. That's part of what I do. I think it's very important. <laughs> when you know better, you do better. Yeah. Right? 
I am going to say that. So yeah, you can't just show up saying it doesn't matter. It does matter. But at that point, for whatever reason, yeah, they were man, they managed to look past it. And, um, you know, I think God put blinders on them for, for temporarily <laughs> to give me the opportunity. So yeah, yeah. yeah you're, you're confident of being ignorant just came through. <laughs> yeah. Right? I'm like, yeah. oh, I got the audition. I guess I got the role. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And I'm sure yeah. they said, well, the outfit's hideous, but she's owning it. So. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Awesome. That's that's a beautiful story. <laughs> um, and, you know, going from being just like this little girl, um, young girl in, in Pittsburgh to like, you know, starring on TV shows and, and movie shows and stuff. What was that defining moment when you finally say, I am successful? Oh, you know, I was so young. I think it was probably being told that I had to have a money manager. Mm-hmm. And I didn't even know what that meant. Yeah. Um, I was m- making more money in a month than my father made in a year. Wow. And, um, you know, I couldn't wrap my head around that at all. I didn't understand money, even the value of it. My parents were older when I was born, and so they still had the effects of growing up during the Depression. So to them, everything was paid cash, and there was a lot of talk about, we can't afford, can't afford, can't afford. Mm-hmm. That was my money language growing up, yeah. um, you know. So when I started to make it, I couldn't even identify. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it was very, wow. it was very surreal to me. And so while that was a great thing to say, oh, I guess I'm being successful, mm-hmm. there was also some hatred that came from, mm-hmm. you know, from one of my siblings, like a jealousy sort of thing that came at me. So that almost reinforced that money is bad. The mm-hmm. fact that I needed somebody to tell me what to do with it. Uh, you know, it fed some, it was good, but it also started to unseed some of these things that were stuff that I had to overcome. You know, I started to trip over things like the I'm not worthy belief. I started to really trip over that when somebody's, you know, pointed out to me, you're successful. I am, I'm not worthy of that. I mean, it was a crazy juxtaposition of what happens. I think um, for artists, I can say in particular, I think I can see that um, a lot of artists also do what I did. They hide behind mm-hmm. their work. Yeah. And yeah. so that I'm not worthy thing, I would just put my work forward and think, well, I'm okay. I don't need to talk to people. Mm-hmm. And that's really not true. Right. right. You know, at some point that changes, that has to change. Mm-hmm. So and um, did did that affect your career at all? You know, it did in that. Gosh, there were so many things that happened along the way, but I think at some point, I realized that I couldn't go on kind of hiding behind my work. And mm-hmm. I see this, by the way, with authors. It's another good example. Yeah. You know, authors write and they put things forward. And then when they say, okay, maybe the publisher or, you know, their community is like, we want you to go on a, on a book tour, come out and sign and talk to people, mm-hmm. be on an interview, you know, get in the media. That's a really uncomfortable place for a lot of them to be. And that's how it was to me. Whenever I would leave the studio, there would be people waiting outside that were fans. We all want fans for what we do, right? I mean, right. we all want fans. We call them now followers on social media or subscribers, but they're fans and and it's a good thing. I was so terrified to meet them that shamefully now I will say that I walked out the back door a lot to get to my car. And mm-hmm. it wasn't that I was trying to be unfriendly. I just felt like, well, they, they don't want to see me. They want to see the characters that I'm playing. Mm-hmm. You know, not and, and the subtitle of my book is powerful presence on camera and off. And I certainly was not powerful in my presence at that mm-hmm. time. So there was there did come a time when that why of my connection to why I'm here on the planet became very pal- it became palpable for me. I had an opportunity to really touch on that. And when your why is big enough and you're given the opportunity, it's mm-hmm. amazing what you can overcome. Exactly. I've had people that have like nearly collapsed because they didn't want to speak in public 
and one woman was doing amazing transformation transformational work with her products um they were hair care products actually mm -hmm. and she had in the beginning she was giving her products to kids that were being bullied it was a whole anti-bullying beginning for her products and mm -hmm. she had befores and afters and yes their hair looked better but she was inspired by how different they felt about themselves mm -hmm. and the effects on their self-esteem and i remember she started to she was in one of my first retreat weekends working on camera and she got so shaky and just couldn't you know just couldn't speak and actually started to convulse like she was just terrified and somebody thought she was going to collapse and you know they started run, rushing up to her i said no 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 wait and i gave her i had somebody bring up that book that had the kids photos with the transformation that she was causing in the world already mm -hmm. and i said tell me about them instantly she stopped shaking wow it's the connection that she made to oh yeah this is why i'm here mm -hmm. this is why i have to do this and it's that connection i mean the people that follow you dr says are heart-centered for sure and if there is something that is so deep in them to to accomplish given the opportunity mm -hmm. those that courage will step forward right over any kind of fear and it's amazing like that woman was amazing what she ended up creating by the end of that weekend she was looking and i didn't i mean i gotta be honest with you at one point I didn't think she was going to make it the whole way, but she went above and beyond. She was looking straight in the camera at the end of the weekend and creating this commercial for her business and her brand. And she was fantastic, fantastic, wow. like a professional. And she was the one that people were going to call the, you know, 911. Because she was <laughs> so it really does make a difference. You know, how connected you are to what it is. How committed are you to following what God has in your heart? Exactly. Exactly, and and um, with 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 that, say, you kind of shift what you focus on. I mean, you you were in on stage and in the limelight, and you, you know how many famous people you <laughs> you connected with, and something changed. You um, you were auditioned for some role, and and something happened that changes your shift. Oh, there were a few things. Yeah. Um, I was still struggling when I would go into, this is before I actually learned to, to kind of accept who I was. This was the shift that, that happened for me that leads me to understand how to help people now. So I think what you're referring to is there was a, um, it's in a, my longer bio. So I, um, I went in for an infomercial hosting audition and the truth is infomercials at that time we used to call them hush money it was mm -hmm. one day usually of work maybe two but a really good paycheck so i mean you know really nice day of work and mm -hmm. when i went in for the quote unquote audition they already told me well you're pretty much the seal deal they want you but we just have to do protocol and put you on a little screen test kind of situation I'm like fine so i go in director hands me the script and he says all right i'll just be yourself those words killed me because I had nothing in that file. Tell me to be anybody else. That's what I was good. For. That's what I was good at. Um, I had no value for that, you know, be yourself. And I kept trying to be what I thought he wanted me to be. He goes, no, 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 just relax. Just be yourself, sweetie. I actually use the word sweetie, which only seemed to make it worse. Yeah. And I, I kind of belittle you, right? Yes. 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 And so that, that actually made it worse. And I remember being so bad i mean i was the epitome of stage fright where it started in my throat and then this is how stage fright works for some people right it starts in the throat and then all of a sudden like your your voice sounds different because you're not breathing mm -hmm. <laughs> right <laughs> no air going in there mm -hmm. and so and so people were like oh my gosh they hear themselves sounding different and they go what is that that's different i shouldn't i shouldn't sound that way what mm -hmm. are people going to think and then the stomach starts to go and it just progresses and your voice gets tighter and you start to shake because you're not breathing there are so many things that lead up to what basically for me was a near collapse like my client that i told you about yeah my knees were shaking so bad he excused me from the audition with this look of pity on his face and i knew i didn't get it mm -hmm. and i drove home and i cried the whole way home and i thought you know there's something wrong with me what I said, mm -hmm. and I have to fix it or I'm going to get out of this business because I am very visible. People expect mm -hmm. me to be able to have a conversation as myself. And so I, I dove into more professional training, you know, on camera training, thinking that's what I needed. That wasn't what I needed at all. What I needed was what I was also doing, which is the self-improvement stuff. You know, I was getting turned on to 
things like Landmark and um, Anthony Robbins. And, you know, I was basically eating up anything that I could that was about self-empowerment and also searching for my faith. And so I was really doing a lot of outreach as well as trying to train myself on camera. What I learned was it didn't matter how much training, and I still say this, doesn't matter how much training you have for stage or, or camera. Mm -hmm. If you don't know what your design is and how awesome you are, mm -hmm. and you may not believe it all the time, mm -hmm. but if you at least understand what your unique brilliance is, you can stand in that. And that is what people are going to be attracted to. It's not how perfect you stand or how good your hair looks. I mean, I told you, I cut, I cut my hair recently and we had this whole conversation about, I don't know what to do with it, right? Like I, I cut like 10 inches of my hair off. I have no idea how to style this thing. I'm actually called up my, my friend and I said, okay, I, this is not the look that I, you need to show me how to do this because I can't. <laughs> um, it's not about doing our hair well and our makeup perfect and, and standing the right way. All those things are helpful. And I'm happy to teach those things to people once they understand that people are coming and attracted to them for who they actually are designed to be and to be that person. Amazing. Amazing. And through, through all those healing journey, that's when you um, started to develop your, your coaching programs, right? Can yes. you tell us a little bit more about your, your programs? Absolutely. So my first, my first program stemmed from work that I was already doing. One of the, one of the people that I took training from, was teaching TV hosting, you know, how to stand up in front of a camera and, and basically host a show. And that wasn't as easy as it is now. People hop on and host their own shows on Facebook and like, you're doing this, you know, and you're doing a great <laughs> job. But people feel like I can host my own show wherever I want to just start a YouTube channel and host my own show. It wasn't like that then. Um, you actually had to have some skills and people were looking for certain things. And so I was working with her and she threw some, she goes, I, I can't work with the newbies anymore. Can you work with them? And she was frustrated. And I said, sure. And I developed, unbeknownst to me, I had a different approach because I did what helped me. Yeah. You know, if they would come in and be freaked out about the script, and this is suitable for anybody that's a speaker or is thinking about speaking or doing a video for their business and they have a script and they're freaking out about it. I would have these, you know, people come in and they'd be looking at the script and all caught up in the words. And I said, okay, just set that down for a second. Just tell me like, you know, do you have kiddos? Do you have dogs? You know, what do you do for fun? And I would wait to see what they looked like on camera they did this all on camera right but I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm recording it but i'm just not having them do the script and so i'm just talking to them and i see how they light up i see how their skin flushes a little bit their eyes get brighter they stand up taller mm -hmm. they take deeper breaths they they get excited they use more notes in their voice mm -hmm. instead of just being monotone as they're reading they're actually talking like you know a little bit more interesting yeah so I was like, okay, I go, do you see how you feel right now? They go, well, yeah, I feel great now. I go, well, this is what you should feel like when you're talking about, you know, your script, your business, what you want to accomplish. Like, this is the same way it should feel. It shouldn't feel any different. Mm -hmm. And that was the biggest revelation for me personally, was when I, I realized that you could actually have fun, you know, in yeah, front of yeah. the camera and doing this and talking about things that are important to you and you think that are important to the, to the planet that it actually can be fun. And so letting those, the criticism and the fear, and that's the thing, like the fear, um, we really work a lot at getting fear and, and you could call it inhibition, anxiety, stress over yeah. the situations of high risk conversations, leading a boardroom, leading an interview, being interviewed, um, hosting a show, getting up on stage, no matter how big or small, you know, mm -hmm. all of those things can carry different levels of anxiety. Mm -hmm. And what, what it constantly comes back down to is realizing what that fear stems from. What are your personal triggers? And this is what we work on. What are your okay. personal triggers? Um, you don't necessarily believe it or not have to go into the whole backstory around why that's a trigger. Mm -hmm. Just know that it's a trigger. And sometimes we go back and we realize, oh, that stems from a voice that was not even yours. You know, it might have been something a bully said to you or somebody said to you or maybe your family member gave you something that you owned and it didn't belong to you. Mm -hmm. So it's giving it back. It's thanking that fear for being there because it's trying to protect you. But right now, it's just in the way. Yeah. And having it take a back seat. So fear is always going to be with you. And it's a good thing. I mean, you mentioned my husband's a stuntman and he always says the day that I am not fearful, I need to get out of the business. 
Mm-hmm. It's just <laughs> controlling that fear because that fear is there to keep us safe. That fear is there for a very, very productive reason. But I think knowing when it should be working and when it's really able to just sit in the back seat and shut up for a little bit, you know, <laughs> give it a binky, put it in the back seat. Keep driving, you know, looking forward in that windshield or where you want to go. And that's really what I do for a lot of people in the process is, you know, we we help them to really discover their own natural way of communication, which is how the nature based training came up. Mm -hmm. Um, Everything that I do is really based on how that person actually naturally communicates, what's been successful for them. Can I give you a for instance on that? Yeah, sure, sure. Um, you work with horses. I know that. Yeah, we do. But, um, we do work with yeah. horses. Uh, but the for instance I was going to give you is a, an example that maybe some people would identify with. I had a woman come to me who was ready to quit her business, and she happened to work in a multi-level marketing company. Mm-hmm. She had quickly risen to the level of you know having the car and the trips and the diamonds around her neck and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. It's a pretty high level, and you know to achieve. Yeah. And I think it was two years. And so the company was very grateful for, you know, everything that she was doing. And and I said, you're so successful, so fast. We we want you to speak at the conference. And so the conference was going to be her getting up in front of several thousand people. Mm-hmm. And she was ready <laughs> to throw in the towel. That's how scared she was. She's like, I didn't sign up for this. This isn't what I do. In her mind, she didn't identify with herself as a speaker because her idea of a speaker might be Anthony Robbins, right? Mm-hmm. It might be yeah. this bigger than life, you know, person that's up on a stage that seems to control and be masterful and extroverted. And that's not her. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, we're going to just reframe this for you. And this is what I do with a lot of people. I'm going to reframe Mm -hmm. this for you. Like, how do you achieve your goals now? How do you create these sales? How do you get to this next level? She goes, well, I'm fine one-to-one with people. I'm like, define fine. She goes, well, I just ask a lot of questions and I get to know them. And I'm like, awesome. So guess what? You're going to walk on the stage and you're going to ask the audience questions. And she went, I can do that. (laughs) (laughs) I'm like, yes. And not only can you, you should, because that's where your gift is. That's where you feel comfortable. That's your pattern of communication. And yes, that's what you're going to do. So we actually mapped out her her talk and her story and threw a ton of questions in there so that she was actually getting feedback from members of the audience. And that made her feel very, very comfortable. So that's her way of doing it. It's not everybody's way of doing it, but that's what I mean. There's a natural way of communicating. And a lot of times we don't even understand what we're putting forward. Mm -hmm. That's where the horse work comes in. You know, it's really interesting. People will take feedback from an animal a lot easier than feedback from a human. (laughs) Of course. I I don't know what that is. From a human is judgmental. Yeah. (laughs) From the animal is loving. It's true. So when a when a horse walks away from somebody, they go, Oh, you know, and they actually say, How can I fix this? When a person walks away, they're like, Oh, well, she's a, you know, whatever. He's a blah blah blah, you know. <laughs> you know, like they label that person because they're so mean they walked away, you know. And on rare occasion I have had, you know, a, a, a person or two say, Oh, that horse is such a, you know, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. But that only gives us more opportunity <laughs> to say, why do you think that, that person, you know, that horse is a you know, bad word. And well, because, and they'll basically say what they expect people to be to them in that situation. You know, um, she's judging me. Okay. So that tells me that they are in a world, their perception is that they feel like they're judged all the time. So there's actually somewhere that we can go with that too. But for the most part, I work with leaders in community and corporate and, and in companies and CEOs and founders of businesses. And, and so when they're in the arena with the horse and they're maybe coming forward with a lot of, a lot of energy and the horse moves away. You know, that's a, that's a lesson to go, well, wait a minute. Do you even know what you're coming forward with? Have you checked in with that, with that other sentient being, meaning the horse that has their own way of thinking and, and being and communicating, yeah. just not with your language. So we take language out of it. Right. So you can't tell your story. You can't say, well, I'm like this because the horse doesn't care. Right. And so it really requires people to take a step back and look, well, what am I? 
appearing as what what are they seeing you know suddenly there's they have to stop be super present and recognize what they might look like to the other person or sentient being that's in the conversation in the relationship and in that case it happens to be a horse mm -hmm. but horses are very available very present and very brutally honest yeah <laughs> i hear you right? i mean like even when when you walk past a dog right if our neighbor walking a dog if if we are not in our right mind if we are angry or whatever we walk, walk right up to the dog they can yeah. feel you <laughs> you don't yeah. have to say a word they'll start barking <laughs> yeah yeah they're very sensitive you know the difference what people don't don't understand and the reason that the horses are such a, a really interesting way to introduce nature-based training to people mm -hmm. is that there is something about horses in particular that people are sometimes afraid of which yeah. is something to work with yeah. and they are sometimes they have a previous experience that caused yeah. them to think that way so it allows us to go back and release that previous fear that's probably showing up in other places they could be trepidatious about taking chances because of something that happened a long time ago regarding a horse so we get those we also get a lot of people that think well they're majestic and strong and mm -hmm. and other people that think well there's this romantic you know version that people have of horses like the unicorn kind of idea you know so all of these things make horses very intriguing to people mm -hmm. and the fact that most of the time horses are curious connecting creatures they want to be connected they're herd animals so in that way they're like us mm -hmm. they, they really do better when they are with their kind as we are we you know the pandemic showed us that how many people had difficult times in seclusion during the pandemic and so it mm -hmm. became very obvious we don't do well when we're by ourselves even introverts have to have connection with other humans right so mm -hmm. relationship is really important relationship is what determines your quality of life truly the quality of your relationships is what determines the quality of your life and so when you're leading that's a whole another level of relationships and and multiple levels because you're leading your family, leading your kiddos, it's a lot different energy than leading your team at work, you know? And how do you maneuver through that? How do you become very self-aware of what you're putting forward? And so the horse work is really wonderful to do that. The reason that they are so sensitive, these animals, they're prey animals. Mm -hmm. So as intimidating as they may seem to some people, they look at the world like everything could consume them. Mm -hmm. When they're in the wild, they're very vulnerable. The only the only thing they have to protect themselves is speed. Mm -hmm. That's it. So when you think about it, there's no claws. There's no they can't bite you. I mean, mm -hmm. yes, they will bite, but that's not going to be any they great can kick you. <laughs> they could kick. But, you know, honestly, as, as somebody said to me, if if, uh, if if a mountain lion is close enough to a horse to be kicked, it's too late already. Yeah. You know, so speed is what they rely on. So it's that fight or flight. So they're constantly reading the energy and saying, am I safe? Am I safe? And the interesting thing is that is something that the more, um, how do I put it? The more out of rhythm we get with nature, mm -hmm. the more we start looking and feeling subconsciously looking for, are we safe? Are we safe? Yeah. So we actually have a lot in common with them. Um, and that shows up when we're doing the nature-based trainings nice nice very interesting really interesting i didn't know that about horses i just know when i was about 13 or 14 years old my neighbor have a horse and i didn't know anything about you know taking care of horses i was like mom can we have a horse my mom's, <laughs> my mom's like what where are you where are you gonna put the horse I was like, what, you know, just like in, my room. in, the, in the little barn back there. <laughs> yeah, it, it was, you know, but they they are, like you say, majestic, they're mystical. They they're just like very intriguing animal. Yeah. And um, I, I would, you know, would love to do that with you one day. I, I think that would be amazing. I um, have a chance to ride horses a few times, but you know yeah not, nothing like 
you know <laughs> it's not the connection you know and that's that's something people don't understand which is interesting we don't ride the horses yeah I mean, at some level when we're doing a retreat we possibly one that we're doing in colorado i have a co-facilitator that may initiate some what we call therapeutic riding but i mean up until this point we don't ride everything is on the ground it's all about communication relationship and you know it's wow. a very different take but it's funny because and it's another lesson mm -hmm. people will say to me well, if you don't ride the horses, what do you do with them? <laughs> and I'll stop and I'll go, and that is our first reframe. <laughs> like, because there you are stopping all possibilities because of what you've seen in the past. You're taking the past because you've seen horses on TV or, you know, maybe in, in a work environment on a ranch, but mm -hmm. you think that that's all that they can be used for. You know, where else are you limiting yourself and what is possible by thinking, of what you've only seen. There's a whole world of stuff that we don't know, stuff that we don't know that we don't know. Exactly. The, the right. more you know, the more you know that you don't know. Don't know. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. And so when somebody says something like that to me, I get really excited. I'm like, well, let's just let's just show you what can happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Great. That 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 is just very interesting. Very interesting. I I probably can ask you about horses and and what you do with the with your retreats all day long but um what are what would be some of the benefits i know you touch on some of them um with your clients receiving from attending your retreats yeah well i there's a few different ways that i work with people just that they're at the retreats with the horses mm -hmm. um, that's not for everybody i get it you know mm -hmm. it, it's not for everybody and that's fine and it there also has to be a geographical you know it has to be geographically yeah. possible so i have clients all over the world that you know would love to come from australia to take one of these mm -hmm. retreats but it's a little costly and mm -hmm. takes a long time so there's not it's the only way i work with people but you know when they come to the retreats i find that within a very short period of time First of all, they're breathing deeper. Mm -hmm. They get back into, as I said, that natural rhythm of just kind of being present. And it's a place that we sometimes have a very difficult time getting to, mm -hmm. um, which is one of the reasons why they say animals are so great to be around because they'll force you to be present. You know, your dog will force you to be present, you know, mm -hmm. by coming up and going, hey, you've been working too long and start pawing on your on your lap like mm -hmm. mine just did you know he just came in the room and like hit on me and you might have seen my arm going like this I was like, <laughs> but but i'm grateful you know there are some things that will bring us into the present but nothing like what i've seen transform when i when i have people come and, and just spend a day or a day and a half or you know we have a three-day retreat that we do a couple of times a year and so during that time it really is a place where people can remember who they are designed to be they remember, you know, that ever since they were a kid, there was something that lit them up. And if they're, they're not incorporating that, whatever that thing might be, mm -hmm. there's a piece of them that's getting starved. And a lot of times that'll show up in maybe the way they're working, in their relationships, either their friend relationships, their intimate relationships, you know, uh, if they're married or they're dating, there may be mm -hmm. issues there. And all of that is connected. I mean, we're, everything that we do is, is connected. We really should be the same person, whether we're at work or whether we're at home. So uh, obviously we're gonna have different language and we're gonna emphasize different things, but um, the idea of taking off one hat and putting on another hat, you're still the same head. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and where is same that head? head? Okay. <laughs> but where is that head? Like, where is your head? Is your head in the present moment? Is your head able to listen and receive and, and not just what other people are telling you, but your own opportunities as well when they show up? Mm -hmm. you know, it's those kind of things that I think really transform and change. And for the people that I work with, you know, that can't make it to the retreats, we're really working on finding that, remembering who they are in the sense of being able to step out, to create content, to be seen and spotlighted, maybe when they didn't plan on being that way. You know, I work with doctors. Doctors didn't go to be a doctor most of the time because they thought they were going to be on TV for it. Mm -hmm. But if they reach a level of success and they're being asked to be interviewed or speak about or teach at a conference, you know what they do that right. can be a very unsettling crazy place for them to be and we have to bring that mind right back down into the present remind them of what they're here to do the big picture and kind of like that first woman that i said was shaking until she remembered oh. her why mm -hmm. to look like i reconnect them with that and then i you know i get really specific when it comes to 
the presentation coaching. So we get into languaging, we get into archetypal branding, and it, it's it's a lot of fun, and mm-hmm. it's very specific. So we can get really, really honed on it. But so everywhere from being super honed about word choices all the way to working with horses in the big arena, literally, you know, mm-hmm. it just depends on what somebody needs and where they are. Right. There, there is definitely a lot, a lot to learn when it comes to personal development, and. Um, you have ooh, added a lot of knowledge <laughs> to to this podcast here. Thank you so much, Sandra. Um, if I, I I want to ask this um, to all my podcast um, guests, <laughs> what is your why? I mean, um, I I kind of guess a little bit. Of, Just listening to to your story, you um, given so much to um, leaders out there. You know, preparing them to be better leaders and stuff like that. But what is your personal why? Why you get up every day doing what you do? I mean, uh, trying to make other people's lives better. Um, you know, making leaders better uh, in in their field. What is the reason why you're doing all that? Underlying all of it. Is yes. revealing revealing God's magnificent. You use that word; it's my favorite word. Yes, God's magnificent design. That's it. So, if that means that I'm taking somebody who is a leader, outwardly successful, and introducing them to a day of being in nature, mm-hmm. and remembering that we're part of that, mm-hmm. and remembering who they are that way, yeah. great. That's going to be a ripple effect when they go back and change how they are being with their team. And how they're seeing their team and communicating with their team, and that will be a ripple effect that has more than just what I created, you know, with them and the time that I had. And the same, God's, you know, revealing God's magnificent design with each individual that I work with, mm-hmm. reminding them that it's been there since the beginning. So I don't give anybody anything new other than some skills to kind of shine, polish up what's already there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So and that's really, really def- yeah. what it is. Yeah. Perfect, perfect. Kind of rediscover who they really are, right? Yeah, and give them the I don't know, as a validation of the freedom. Like I hold that place for them to feel free within that until they can see that they can be that way. Because that's what I needed. I was terrified to even find out who I was in the beginning. And so for me, I can see how powerful that is. And sometimes it's just a tiny shift. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just a tiny shift. Somebody that has been in corporate for a long time that is now becoming their own brand, and their languaging is very exactly. corporate because that's what they're used to. Exactly. You know, I tell the story of when I first moved here to. It's in fact it's the intro of my book. When we first moved here to um, to Austin, we brought our horses from California where they didn't have anything. They didn't have mm-hmm. any space to run. It was a small paddock and a stall, and we would go out and take them out for. Hours at a time, but I'd have to be on their back. You know, they weren't free to go, as I said, be horses and be who who they were designed to be. Mm-hmm. So it was my joy to be able to bring them here and have a little land where they could run and mm-hmm. actually, you know. And the sad thing was, after they were here for a couple of days, we kept them at the barn because there were trucks pulling in and out and things like that. So we just said, okay. After a couple of days, it was time to let them go see all this space that they could run and go do what I think God designed them to do, and they ran back to the barn. Oh, <laughs> they wouldn't go, and I'm like, I'm looking at the field. I'm like, uh-huh. this is where you're supposed to be. Look at your legs. Your legs are long. They run. This is where you're, you're supposed to be here. You know, uh-huh. and and as clear as it was to me, they had been living in a small space for so long. And I think that's what I would say to people when I would speak. I would say, why are you sticking? Where in your life are you sticking close to the barn? Mm-hmm. Because it's all you know. Exactly. You know, there's opportunities that I know I stuck close to the barn and I passed up, and I can't regret them because I am where I am today because I made the choices I made today. So mm-hmm. no use in regretting it. But I look back and go, yes, there were definitely opportunities that I was perfectly capable of taking, mm-hmm. but because it was outside of my comfort zone, 
you know, in your comfort zone. Like somebody said to me, one little voice popped up one time when I said that. She goes, I love the smell of a barn. I go, yes, but when it fills with too much manure, it gets really stinky. (laughs) (laughs) And you have to leave, you know, you have to get some fresh air. And when you do realize that there's a big wide world out there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it took about three, four days, but I did have the pleasure of finally my horses took off one, you know, one morning and and just ran and ran and ran. And it was just it was so beautiful. And I thought, you know, I was so excited to see that and I didn't create them. I just own them. You know, Mm -hmm. I didn't create them, but I knew that they were just doing it because they it felt good. And, and they were enjoying it, you know, and they were using their body and everything that they were designed to do to just run all of this property after each other. And mm-hmm. it was great. And I thought, you know, that must, that must be how God feels whenever we step into how we're designed. Exactly. So that's a big motivation for me, you know, nice. to get up and just say, I'm here for a reason, you know, mm-hmm. I've been saved from you know, a few precarious situations in my life for a reason. And I think there's probably people listening and watching that can say the same thing. It's like, yeah, you know, close calls. Maybe it was a near miss with an accident in a car or whatever it was. I mean, if you're still here, you're here for a reason. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you. That was beautiful. That was beautiful. Thank you, Sandra. Um, you you have so much success, um, so much um, golden nuggets that you, you gave to our listener and and you know people who watch this so far what what would be one one major thing that you would um if you mentioned it already you want to repeat that that what is the one thing that the one golden nugget that you want to give to women out there who going through difficulties or trying to overcome something uh, want to heal themselves what is that one thing that you want to tell them It's the same thing that I would tell men as well. Mm -hmm. Um, Don't believe what other people tell you about you. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is whether it's good or bad. So Mm -hmm. I've been, as you mentioned, I've been in the world where people are famous, Mm -hmm. you know, and I've, yes, I've met plenty of them. My husband has met plenty of them. There are some wonderful people and, and, you know, like anything else, there are those that are like a little self-absorbed, but Okay. I mean, they are their own product, so I understand how that happens. But there is a danger when you are successful, and you could be a successful lawyer, doesn't have to be, you know, television or movie personality, but when you are successful, there is a situation where people can tell you everything is fine, don't worry, you're good, we can do this, Mm -hmm. you know, um, you've made the right choice, and sometimes they're yes people, so that they can remain in your orbit. Yeah. So don't believe what people say about you. If something doesn't feel right, I always say check in, you know, um, take the time to sit with quiet and say, am I doing the right thing? Does this feel like it's in alignment with me? Mm -hmm. And the same goes when somebody tells you something about you that is not so nice. Mm -hmm. You know, listening to Shauna Sumpter uh, just this morning and she was saying, you know, if you don't have haters, Mm -hmm. you're not working hard enough. Yeah. If you want to accomplish something, you have to take a stand. Mm -hmm. And when you take a stand, you're going to have people that are going to cut you down. And they'll say things. And there comes a point where, I'm not saying that you shouldn't be sensitive, but there comes a point where you can't believe what they say. It may be words that were spoken to you when you were younger, you know, where my mother said horrible things over me. Mm -hmm. And there came a point where I went, you know what? Those words don't belong to me. Mm -hmm. So... The best thing that you can do for yourself is to really try to see yourself how God sees you, see other people the same way. But don't believe what other humans say about you because they don't really know you. Oh, that's just so beautiful. I love it. I love it. And and I love it that we see things the same way. I love it that you put it in, in a way that said, see yourself um, the way God created you and see other people the same way yeah right so, sometimes hard. <laughs> it is hard it is hard but yes that's that's the way to peace 
right? And that if if we all would just do that, we will end all wars and you know. I know. Well, yeah. the next time somebody cuts yeah. you off in traffic, you know, try to see that person as God sees them. It's not easy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> like, ah! but, but that 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 is opportunity <laughs> for personal growth and forgiveness. Yes. Yes. <laughs> That's it. It's opportunity. That's right. <laughs> All right. You're you're amazing. You are definitely a true goddess, and I would love for you to come back a million times to a <laughs> true goddess podcast because you perfectly fit this podcast. And thank you so much, Sandra, for this amazing, amazing hour that you gave to us. And um, there is one last thing that I. <laughs> That that I ask to all my guests, okay, because you give so much, because you're such a wonderful human being. If you were given a genie in a bottle, and you have three wishes, okay, <laughs> what would those three wishes be? You don't have to say why. Just what would it okay. be? Um, I would love to see people sharing. More beauty, empathy, and love, mm-hmm. and less dis- divisive mm-hmm. comments and hatred. Yeah, on social media, particularly. That's what was in my mind when you said that. It was like social media. Like, let's mm-hmm. just say, the people that share some positive stuff is so few, mm-hmm. and there's no reason for that. Every person listening to this can post something that's positive and inspiring today. Yeah, yeah. so we can that's ship that. You know, second. Um, I'd love to see an increase on educating our young people mm-hmm. on the value of nature and the beauty of creating. Mm-hmm. So I see a lot of schools are defunding art programs, mm-hmm. and I think it's so essential to our brains to be able to feed those children that have that as a strength. Mm-hmm. That have that right brain creativity. That's where ideas come from. That's where our future comes from. And that, that also that connection to nature. Like I live in a, a rather rural, beautiful area, and I can hear, you know, there's a few big houses. The kids go and hang out, and I hear them yelling and screaming and jumping on trampolines and things like that. And mm-hmm. and it's so awesome. I would love to hear that noise in my community mm-hmm. more. Instead of driving into a you know a subdivision and having no children out because they're all in front of a screen, which is fine at times, but there's so much more to learn. So I think an emphasis on that would be great. And thirdly, just knowing that whatever I create would benefit generations to come. Mm-hmm. So as I'm creating things and I'm looking you know into the future, like can I create something that would be able to be handed down and will. Impact people when I'm gone. Yeah. Those are my three wishes. And guess what? Your three wishes will come true. <laughs> okay. Bing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, th- thank you. Thank you so much, Sandra. Thank you Thanks for, for um, your wisdom, for your charisma, um, for everything that that you've given our lead. Um, Our listener and people who watch us on YouTube today, it, it just has been amazing. Our, I, I, as I say, I can talk to you all day, and but I know you have an appointment coming up in a little bit, so I'm gonna let you go. But you know, please come back, and um, you are definitely uh, a true inspiration. And um, you know, many women, I'm sure, listening to this. Um, we'll get a lot of inspiration, um, a lot of um, wisdom from from your words. Thank you, thank you, and we'll talk again soon. You got it. <laughs> thank you, Sandra.